Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of HDE Podcast, I'm Ronald. In today's episode, I want to talk to you about something that's a bit of a pain for most embedded engineers, and that is when you have to maintain multiple versions of a compiled code, i.e. you have to compile multiple versions based on whatever feature requirements or hardware limitations or whatever platform you're putting it in. Because I'll be honest, when it comes to software or maintaining uh, maintaining um, different versions of the same software, it's easy, but when you have to compile and maintain that aspect physically, it's kind of daunting, especially when you have to deal with uh, debugging uh, different hardware or, diff or debugging when you've got at least 30 different compiled code uh, that some have some issues and others don't, and anyway. Now, I'll, I'll be upfront straight away. I'm not saying that this is a bad thing to go down the route on, or at least it, I'm not saying that it's bad to uh, have a project that does that. I'm just saying that in some situations, if you could avoid that, avoid it, and in other situations, it makes perfect sense, so... Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of HTE Podcast, I'm Ronald. In today's episode, I want to talk to you about something that's a bit of a pain for most embedded engineers, and that is when you have to maintain multiple versions of the same firmware. You've written code, and now you're having to compile multiple versions based on whatever feature requirement or whatever uh, adjustable, customizable user interface, like such as a logo, or even maybe because you've got some hardware restrictions that means that you can only have so much code space, and so therefore, you have to go down that route. Now, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to be in a situation, or I'm not saying it's a bad thing to decide on a project to go down that route. I'm just saying that in some situations it makes perfect sense and in others it doesn't. So I'm hoping that in today's episode serves as a kind of guide to better, well, to help you make a better decision as to whether you do want to go down the route of making or maintaining multiple versions of the firmware or not. I'm also going to try and cover some of the things you could do to make the situation easier. Um, because I'll be honest, when it comes to software, there's loads of automated tools that you can use to compile your code and maybe spit out 30 different versions. But when it comes to actually taking that firmware, loading it into hardware and keeping track of them in the field and finding out who has what firmware and so on, there isn't necessarily the best tool for that. And so I just want to give you some guide on to that anyway and possibly hint that you might be worth you spending some extra time writing programs or well, at least um, at least some app that makes the job a little easier not just rely on Excel for stuff like that. So, or at least some, um, well, yeah, table setup or whatever it is anyway. So let me kind of be honest about one thing. The reason I'm doing this episode is because recently I've had to go back to a project that I worked on many moons ago. And in that project, uh, the decision was made that we'll just compile based on whatever language or whatever feature the client wants, well, the end client wants. And it's fine because originally when I was involved with it, the idea was to have maybe four or five different versions. And that's, you know, that's, I don't think that's too far fetched to kind of do, deal with. But when I left, and I come back to work on that project again. Uh, turns out the sales had other, mi other minds, and now there's like 30 or 40 different versions I can't really say because I'm still waiting to get all the information that I need. But anyway, it's a pain, especially when the issue it, you're finding with some of the firmware is on some but not others, and you kind of now have to run all your tests 30, 40 different times to verify every single one of them. It's annoying. So just yeah, that's the reason why I'm doing this episode. I'm kind of hoping that anybody who's new to embedded electronics, it's aware of the effects if you do decide to not actually, well, if you decide to go down the route of maintaining multiple firmware and not really see the full extent. Um, in my case, uh, what engineering wanted to do and what sales wanted to do didn't really kind of sync or it didn't really, you know, it wasn't really defined enough. And so therefore my decision probably would have been completely different if I realized what the final outcome was going to be. But anyway, we all make mistakes, mistakes and we all wish, well, to be honest, we all end up going back to projects and wish we made things slightly different or, slightly, or change this here and that. So anyway, so it's not new. So with regards to maintaining multiple versions of the firmware, let me give you a couple of situations you might be faced with, whether you want to do it or not. And again, like I said, not every situation is a bad, you know, not every situation is bad for going down the road and not every situation is good. So hopefully, like I said, this serves as a good guide. So some of the situations you might be faced with that might restrict what you can do with the firmware and kind of 
lead you in the direction of having to maintain multiple versions are things like, for example, uh, one of the most obvious one is the memory restriction on a Mac controller. For whatever reason, you've you've selected a Mac controller and the memory is limited. So maybe you chose a particular Mac controller because it has a particular peripheral that you want to use. Uh, maybe it has some advanced CAN or advanced Ethernet port that you really, really need for this particular project. And so therefore you have to use the micro, but unfortunately the micro doesn't have enough memory to run your program. Or it could be something as simple as the fact that you've, you've joined the project and the project has evolved throughout time and you have no choice but to work with the existing uh, setup and unfortunately that might mean, again, uh, limited memory. Or you might be in another situation, for example, where um, you are trying to keep the cost low and so you don't want to spend too much money on a micro and all the other peripherals or whatever extra requirements you might need that might make the uh, swapping between peripheral uh, swapping between features easier now so that's memory and that could you know the obvious one is if you don't have enough memory space to implement all of the features that you want but maybe the other one could be hardware restriction maybe the bump cost maybe you do have a controller that has enough memory to implement all the features that you want but you don't have uh, enough money or there's not enough uh, money allocated to the project to add things like dip switches or switches or maybe maybe even the location where the hard risk can be placed restricts on who can enable and disable things for example you've got a board where it's going to be placed like 200 miles from where you're based and rather than you having to travel 200 miles every time you want to enable or disable a feature maybe it just makes sense just to send somebody a firmware and let them load it up or something like that rather than trying to get somebody to go to the hardware and open up the case and get inside and flip some switch. Well, then again, that doesn't make sense because you could just, if they're going to be, if, they, if they're going to have to connect and load some firmware, or maybe actually thinking back about it, let's think more, more modern stuff, uh, like Internet of Things, you've decided to put a little widget that meshes some sensor out there and it's already connected to the internet. So you can just load firmware to it and it'll be easy to do that rather than just to send somebody out there 200 miles and flick a switch or hit a dip switch or shine some light or whatever whatever new peripheral sensory feature way of programming it shining light though sounds kind of like an interesting way of programming of or enabling disabling features anyway so maybe that's a restriction you can't add extra hardware to it maybe the location is a restriction so therefore it makes more sense for you to implement firmware changes as opposed to uh, implementing the features uh, adjustable features elsewhere uh, I mean, let me give you, let me kind of expand that a bit more because um, I'm kind of liking the flow of that a bit. So, for example, you've got a hardware, you put it out 200 miles away and you want to be able to reprogram it. You happen to have an SD card attached to it. Therefore, yeah, okay, put a file in there. Maybe this got the settings. Maybe the cost restricts you from having to use an SD card or maybe the SD card is un unrobust and reliable enough for you to use out in the field and therefore you can... Anyway, I think I'm kind of really kill this cat here. Well, no, I'm saying that you should kill cats. But I'm really butchering this resistor here. So we'll leave it as it is. So that's one possible thing. Maybe the hardware, again, it's the restriction. Or maybe there could be a legislation or standard that's not unheard of. Maybe you've got something like ATEX where it says, okay, this firmware has to be locked in place and can't be changed. And so therefore, it, it makes perfect sense to implement all the features you need. And it, it's, you know, it's locked down and you don't want somebody to go in there and start making changes. So you have to hard code all the settings, for example, or whatever other standards. Maybe that's the restrictions. Uh, I think most, most, more often than not, it tends to be to do with the uh, memory restriction. You've you've worked in a project, the project's been going for a few years, been out there, and then suddenly new features get added because the project involved, and therefore you run out of memory, and therefore it makes more sense at that point to just stop um, trying to implement everything into a single firmware and just release multiple versions of the same code, assuming you couldn't optimize and try and squish that extra byte in there or so. So anyway, so the, the, you know, there's those are possible situations you might be faced with. And, you know, it, it's it's perfectly normal to be in that point. It, it's, it's, it's perfectly fine. I mean, hopefully you're in a situation where you can decide right from the beginning what you want to do with the hardware and make it as flexible as you want to. And hopefully you don't get stuck on that in the near future. But you can't really just say that, that every project is going to relate. You can't just, in every project, oh, yeah, let's avoid having multiple firmware and let's just make sure we always whack as much memory in there, an SD card and, you know, some massive amount of memory in there just to make sure that we always have enough space to implement everything. Project Evolve, you have a project and maybe you've got a board that's going out on the field, like I just said, that, you know, you can't make changes to and maybe you have to update the firmware, in which case you might not have a choice but to implement different versions. Now, with regards to... Um, features that you might want to implement that might you know might force you to have multiple versions of the same code a good example is like language packs 
Imagine you got yourself a little widget with a screen with a user interface that's going to go to a particular part of the country or a particular part in the world. And you want to be able to adjust different languages and you don't have enough memory to implement every single language in the world. It makes no sense to support every single language or at least have a, well, a text file for every single different combination you might have. It might not make sense. Um, you might not be as fortunate to be able to do that, in which case it makes perfect sense to compile the code based on which region it goes. Um, but in some cases, it might be things, something, as, uh, something, something as simple as the sales team has come back and they say, we need a way to lock these features down so only certain people can have it and we must make sure that they can't get it, get in at it and, you know, hack it apart. I've, and I've worked in industries where you do have to actually worry about the people that are going to get the product at the end because they do have the technical skills to go in there and start flicking around and messing around with stuff. And you do want to make sure that the product is safe for them to use. And it might not be something as malicious as say, oh, well, I'm going to make sure they have to pay for this particular feature. It might be something as simple as, say, for an ATX product that if they enable a particular feature, it might make the product unsafe. Uh, in which case, do the right thing and make sure they're aware of that. So let them decide. But in, in all honesty, though, when it comes to things like ATEX, um, you've as long as you put out the product there and you've done everything that your standard required you and you've been approved for that, then, yeah, fine. If some, some user decides to take an axe at it and use it in a way that it shouldn't be used, uh, for whatever reason, decide to hack things up, then obviously that's a different problem. I'm completely going off topic here. Now, the thing, the issue I tend to have with maintaining multiple ver versions of the same firmware and I'm kind of moving away from situations you might be faced with, it's the maintaining side of things. I know that sounds obvious. It's it's the fact that if you've got multiple versions and you have to start debugging each one of them, that's the bit that's a bit of a pain. And as I mentioned, it when it comes to software and maintaining different for, uh, different programs, then there are tools that you can do to do that. There's, there are tools. Uh, when In the open source community, there's loads of tools you can use to automate the process of compiling and releasing and keeping track and enabling and disabling and, you know, there's loads of tools for that, but when it comes to physical firmware, we, well, not physical, but getting firmware in, in a physical hardware, make, making sure that some have that firmware, not others, and so on, and providing the means to enable and disable those features, it's a different kettle of fish altogether. It's a different task that you have to deal with, and it's a pain. And that's the bit that I feel that some people don't tend to think twice of. They just assume, oh, I've got a bootloader, which is loaded firmware, and off it goes. Yes. But how do you how do you go and make sure the right firmware goes to the right hardware? That's the bit. That's the pain. Yeah, I mentioned at the, at the beginning that actually debugging is a pain. That's also a, 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 a bit of an annoyance to deal with. But there are once you've got yourself a workflow, it might not be too bad. For example, let me take a step back and then just kind of deal with deal with the engineering side of things, and that is compiling and having those firmware. Compiling code. It, depending on which kind of compiler you're using, you, it can be as simple, something as simple as writing a script that automatically adjusts the features, recompiles, and generates and allocates the firmware in the right location. So, for example, if you're using an ST32 um, micro and you're using the open source ARM GNU uh, compiler, then it's very easy for you to just give it the source code, headers, and basically say, all right, include this header. If you're this particular product, include that header in that particular product, and then the output put on this one for this one, and the output put on that one. And then you can even go as far as actually in scripting, well, use the script to, to modify the, the source code to add and enable features. If you want to go even as far as that, it can be done. If you know Python, JavaScript, or whatever language, Ruby, that you got, you can make changes to the to the code dynamically, and it makes the job easier to ma to maintain as far as that. And you can even go as far as even including things like revision and control into your uh, automation process. So compile, um, move the files to a particular location, and then once you've done that, then commit the changes, and that way it's all there, permanently safe, ready to go. And then whichever external system you've got, imagine you've got. I'm kind of picturing here, by the way. Uh, internal thing widget going out there that constantly checks see if there's any any new firmware to deal with and basically just checks checks the git uh, repository there is a new firmware download that uh, program itself and off it goes so you can do that and that's you know an easy way to kind of do deal with that but not everybody has internet connections on their devices when they're miles away not everybody wants to have internet connection on their widgets so you kind of have to deal with that issue and on top of that how do you make sure that the device that it's downloading the bootloader actually uh, gets the correct firmware because you know at the end of the day though are you going to hard code that oops at the end of the day are you going to go are you going to hard code that on the firmware as well telling it which file it needs to get in which case 
that itself adds more headache because what if you get that wrong? Maybe there's a bug on that and you end up downloading the, right, the wrong firmware. So, okay, I'm going. I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm I'm going a little bit more of a you know ends of the world doom situation. So let's cut that cut that out while we still can, really. So so you're in that situation, but. What if you just got a simple product that you 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 are getting in from manufacturer PCB? You load the firmware and you send it off to your client. Maybe you're in the industry where you only you only selling a 1020 anyway, and so it makes no sense to add a Mova modem in there or even add a USB connected to bootloader or whatever serial. And not everybody sells products to the make industry where, where everybody is, is is more than willing to go ahead and connect the device to the computer and, and program it. Maybe you're selling it to somebody who has no idea about computers, no idea about hardware. They just want a gadget that tells them, you know, the UV reading of that room and want that to work with their company logo in there, which happens to be the one annoying thing that sets them apart to every other client. Maybe that's something like that. Although that sounds like an interesting product to have. Anyway, I'm talking like a nerd, really, so I want to know what the UV... Anyway, so yeah, you might be in that situation. In which case, how do you make sure that that client always gets the correct firmware? This this is this is a bit that's a bit annoying. The logistic of delivering the product, so delivering the firmware to the correct person. Now, if you're a small company, then chances are you probably don't have the time on the resources to implement a very complicated system or, or implement a system that it's kind of a bit overwhelming for most people. And I'm talking about things like if you just like maybe a couple of people in your company and you've got uh, an engineer that's just released all these different firmware, you know, it might be something as simple as you just creating an Excel file saying this firmware goes to this client and so on. Or maybe even, maybe if you're lucky enough, the engineer knows a bit about databases and go, go on ahead and created a web page somewhere that you can go ahead and quickly go through and find which firm goes to what and so on. But how do you deliver that product? And how do you deliver that firmware? What, what can we do to make that easier? Now, I did mention you can do something as simple as creating an Excel that lists the firmware version and whatever sets each one of them apart and then list whatever client, off it goes, fine. And then someone can open that and see it. But that isn't foolproof. And annoyingly, that that's, that has rooms for mistake as well anyway. I mean, you could, if you know a bit about um, uh, coding in Excel, then you can possibly make that even easier. What I'm suggesting is if, Actually, what I'm suggesting is to actually go the extra mile. Do you want to build a tool that makes the process easier to guarantee that the person are checking out the correct version and using that correct version? If you're lucky, for example, that you are in a situation as, a, uh, as an engineer to actually um, be allowed to release product to the world as, you know, as open as you want to, then it might make sense for you to actually create a portal or a system that people can log in and correct and get the correct firmware. So, I mean, you see this all the time when you get things like uh, like a consumer product, you go to the consumer website or say like something like um, Apple or whatever, not Apple, but other companies where you can actually go to the website, go through, find the correct motherboard, find the correct version and then download, download the firmware and deliver it down to you to screw that up. And hopefully your firmware on your device, whatever it is that you got, it's smart enough not to program itself with a firmware that's incompatible, but not everybody has that um, that choice anyway. But you do need to think about that. But that's what I'm talking about, dealing with that. Because that in itself could be a reason why some products are going out there that you've compiled down, it's been loaded to the wrong device, and maybe that's what's causing your issue. You really need to think about that risk. Now, the other thing as well is that when you're compiling multiple versions of the same firmware, how many different versions are you actually going to have? Now, as I mentioned, uh, the example I've just given you there that, you know, um, you know, having a logo based on per company, that itself is opening itself. That itself is opening up to a situation where the more clients your company have, the more versions you have, and that could grow. and And I'll be honest, um, not many people tend to talk about this, but when it comes to debugging, the more versions that you have to deal with, the workload that you have exponentially grows. So I I know that sounds kind of really silly, but think about it. If you have two versions to maintain and to check and run all your tests on, that's twice as much work. When you have three, see what I mean? Exponential. It does add up. So the point is, though, think about that as well. So are you willing to spend that time debugging each and one of them anyway to get to the final product and make sure that each one of them is working? Do you want to be doing that? And are you willing? Are you willing to get to that point? Now, that's where you possibly need to start thinking about. Uh, how do you go about testing and autom automating that process? Now, if you're lucky enough and you're a large enough corporation where they're willing to invest on things like um, uh, test uh, test jigs, I mean, to be honest, creating a test jig isn't difficult and isn't expensive. 
but it might be one of those things that tend to be overlooked on uh, for smaller companies. And I have worked in small companies where putting together a test jig tends to always be an, an afterthought. Uh, so that thing that, oh, well, do we need to do that? Can we not just get somebody to click a button and see how that goes? In which case, that's, you know, that's fine. But personally, if you've got the time and the resources, I would definitely go and design that into your product as you're doing it. But that's going too far with that anyway. So yeah, maintaining different multiple versions is a pain. Now, when you do want to do it, though, it makes perfect sense. If you're in a situation where you can easily deliver the products without having to constantly worry about who's getting it and who isn't getting it and who's going to get the right firmware and debugging it, then it makes perfect sense. Now, in the situation where you're joining in an existing team and you have an existing product that you can't make changes to, maybe some requirement means that you can't make changes to the hardware, then chances are you're going to get to a situation, a situation where you have to deal with that. And hopefully it might be further further down the line than anything else, but I would definitely start planning that, start assuming that this product, which is locked and can't make any changes to, will be in a situation where sooner or later, people want custom firmware. And people pay for that. And be honest that for a salesperson, that's a really awesome situation to be in. As far as they're concerned, if they're, if you can make a slight tweak to the to the firmware and they can add, uh, add, an, 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 uh, add more to the cost, then brilliant, they're happy with that. And so don't assume that just because the product that you've designed is quite flexible and ready to go, isn't ever going to be in a situation where you may have to evolve the firmware further down the line or even make changes to the things look, then, you know, think about that. Now, here's a few things that might be worth thinking about. Some telltale signs that the this product that you're putting together may sooner or later be faced with this. Like, I, I, I very briefly gave a hint on it. If you design a product that has a user interface in it, and you are delivering that product to a final client, and you're going to have multiple clients, one of them may sooner or later ask for a slight UI change, or might ask for a slight logo change, or might ask for you to remove the logo altogether. That might be the hint as to when you need to start considering what you're going to do when you have to maintain multiple versions. Now, I'll be honest, let's assume you've, you've designed the firmware to be so flexible that you can adjust everything in menu, you now may have to start thinking about maintaining those settings, keeping track of those settings, making sure those settings are going to the client. So those were, to be honest, might be um, faced, well, might share commonalities. So there's a hint right there that you may have to deal with us sooner or later. It might actually be worth thinking about from the very beginning how you want to maintain that sort of stuff. And I've been there. I've, I've had products going out there where I've decided, okay, you know what? We'll attach an SD card in there. And based on the settings on this file, then we'll change this information here or change that there. And I thought it was as easy as that. And then suddenly, oh, now we've got 20 different versions of the settings. Um, I didn't bother adding a version or a client tag to it, so I know which one goes to what. Obviously, I've learned from that, made those changes. Luckily enough, for that product, we were able to just push the firmware update to all of them, but it might not necessarily be the same for everything out there that you've got there. You may actually have to go as far as actually providing a means to make those changes out in the field. So do you have the space for that? Maybe that could be the reason why you have, you're forced to make those changes between them. I'm going over the top, but there, there should be some hints in there straight away. If there's something that can be customizable, something that can be changed based on the final need, then that should be in itself a hint that you may sooner or later have to deal with maintaining multiple versions, whether that is compiled code or just a setting file or it's just the general settings com uh, configurations on there. Now, if you're lucky, some of those products can be just given to a client and let them make their setting adjustment off it goes. If you're unlucky, they might turn around and ask you to provide a way to do that automatically, in which case you really need to be thinking about that. And anyway, sales love that. If you if you do if you do have a tool that actually make those changes for people automatically, then they'll love that. Just don't be an ass and make sure you don't lock it down. If you've got tools that everybody can use, let them use it. So you can let them, if you, if you, if you nah, oh okay, that's a different issue altogether. I'm gonna stop right there. Anyway, so that is it for me. If you guys have any questions or if you find this topic interesting, do let me know. Uh, I will be publishing the video onto YouTube, so you can leave comments in there. Or you can head over to my uh, homepage. Uh, the podcast is obviously published there. And there's a comment section there if you've got any questions. But the best place to get to me and the best place to ask questions is Twitter. My username is Optical Worm. And for the podcast, is HDE Electronics. So see you later. Bye.